Hi there, and welcome to this online lesson brought to you by Garden Organic. Today we'll be learning about composting. Garden Organic is the national charity for organic growing. At the heart of Garden Organic are the members' experiments, which involve ordinary people all over the country trying different growing methods and techniques in their gardens and reporting back their results, so we can write up the results fully to share with everyone. The Heritage Seed Library protects vegetable varieties that are hard to find today. We don't lock them away somewhere like a gene bank, but share them with our members to grow and enjoy. We have several other projects like master composters, master gardeners and waste reduction volunteers too, which all involve volunteers giving advice to their local communities. So what is organic? It's not just about avoiding chemicals and pesticides. Who wants their fruit and vegetables covered in chemicals? Ooh. They also have a terrible effect on our wildlife. Look at how numbers of bees have reduced around the world. It's also about growing in natural and sustainable ways. Being sustainable means to do things in a way that means you can keep doing them without damaging the environment. We know it's not difficult to do because it's what people were doing 150 years ago in the days before industry and man-made products. It involves feeding the soil, encouraging wildlife and managing pests and diseases naturally. The five principles of organic growing. By principles we mean a bit like a set of school rules you will follow to make your school a better place. Number one, build and maintain the health of our soils because all plant growth starts there in the ground. Number two, encourage biodiversity, our plants, insects, birds and mammals. Number three, use resources responsibly by not wasting water, energy or wood and not using man-made things like plastic. Number four, avoid using those harmful chemicals I've just mentioned. Number five, maintain a healthy growing area is a bit like looking after your body and making the right choices like good hygiene and looking for signs to avoid problems. Now it might look like the arrows are actually attacking the compost but it's actually quite the opposite. A garden organic, we believe composting is at the heart of all these principles and it's at the center of any organic garden. So first of all, let's look at decomposition. When living things die, they decompose or rot. Let's look at how a peach like this decomposes over just six days. So if we start from the top left, the peach is looking nice and normal, and then it works its way down, and it's getting a bit browner, and a bit wrinklier, and it's growing mould now, and oh, that's disgusting! Don't make me eat that! Whew, sorry about that. Reminded me of a nightmare I had about a big brown, wrinkly, mouldy peach chasing me through a field. Oh, that's better. All of this food and these plants, animals and insects, they all rot down or decompose and become part of the soil. These are broken down by decomposers like bacteria, fungi and worms. Does anyone else think the decomposers could be the next big superhero film series? The decomposers breaking down food and plants and animals and insects. No? Nobody else feeling this? Okay, moving on. Now I'm sure you've looked at food chains and webs before in class and the soil is no different. It's a complex food web feeding on the organic matter as well as each other. And here's a diagram showing how it works. No, it's not a big mouldy pyramid. It's that food web thing we were talking about in the last slide. So let's look a little closer. At the bottom we have all that organic matter like fruit, veg and plants. Then they're being munched up by the level one decomposers, the bacteria and the fungi, the ones you really would need a microscope to see. Then above that, whoa, now everyone's been invited to the party. We've got worms and beetles and spiders and centipedes and millipedes and ants and flies. They're all eating the organic matter, eating each other, or both, the greedy little decomposers. But it doesn't stop there. 
we have some gate crashes to the party. These larger creatures also come along because of all those tasty little decomposers who are too busy eating all that organic matter and each other to see the giant beak coming down and whoom! It's night night time for Mr Worm. But don't be sad for Mr Worm because there's a happy side to this story and that's what the plants get out of all this activity. All those tiny pieces of organic matter the decomposers left behind become part of the soil and the plants use these to grow. We call them nutrients. It's just like a healthy smoothie of goodness for plants. A soil smoothie. Actually, that doesn't sound so good now, does it? So how is compost different? Well, compost is made up purely of rich organic matter like fruit, vegetables, grass, leaves, twigs, and even cardboard. Now, soil does have some of this stuff, but it has far more rock, sand, silt and clay. So when compost is added to ordinary soil, it makes it richer and more full of life. Not that I'm suggesting anyone should have a teaspoon of compost a day. In fact, let me make that really clear right now. Never eat a teaspoon of compost. But if you were stupid enough to put a gram of compost onto a nice clean teaspoon from your kitchen, it would be home to millions of microscopic creatures. So why should we compost? There's loads of reasons. Let's whiz through them now. Not surprisingly, it helps your garden grow. As we've already seen, compost gives life to your soil. It also helps it hold more water. It feeds other plants and other creatures in the soil. And because it's so healthy for the soil, it helps control diseases too. If you're a gardener, compost saves you money too because it means you don't have to buy all those fancy pantsy man-made products you see in garden centres which claim to improve your soil and fertilise it. In other words, add nutrients. Why do that when compost is crammed full of nutrients? And you can even cover your soil with compost to create a mulch, which is the gardening equivalent of covering your soil with a big cosy duvet but a big cosy duvet that also makes the soil richer and even stops weeds from growing through. Not my idea of a duvet day, but trust me, your garden will thank you for it. Compost does actually reduce pollution. Making compost creates a cleaner planet, as it means less people are burning garden waste in bonfires, which are bad for air pollution. If we all used compost instead of manufactured products, gardening products that are made in factories, then it would mean less energy and water was wasted, as well as less transport emissions. Putting your kitchen and garden waste in a home compost bin reduces emissions from transporting it and disposing of it too. <coughs> Sticking with the theme of waste for a moment, it is thought that each compost bin stops about 150 kilograms of waste going to landfill every year. That's about the same as throwing away 250,000 pencils. <laughs> Landfills give off a greenhouse gas called methane, which does not last in the atmosphere as long as CO2, called carbon dioxide, but it traps CO2 in our atmosphere, making the earth get hotter. One of the great things about composting is that nothing is wasted. It's a closed loop cycle. It's your waste, you make it into something else, that's the compost, and you use it in your garden to make your soil better and grow wonderful flowers, fruit and vegetables. Clever stuff. I'm sure you've heard of the phrase reduce, reuse and recycle and seen it around school. It's important to remember that reduce is at the top for a reason. It really is the best thing you can do. Reusing things like shopping bags, water bottles, coffee cups, cloths and cutlery over and over again instead of things we just throw away after one use is the next best thing. Now recycling is the third thing on the list. We all need to do it as much as possible but it's better to make and use less than making more and more things we don't need and then having to recycle it. Now composting is a slightly better way of getting rid of our waste than recycling as it doesn't need trucks, plastic bins and energy. It's just a bin or heap at the end of your garden. Simples.
Making lovely compost at home means your mums and dads aren't going out to garden centres and buying peat compost. Now peat compost is everywhere. We used 24 million wheelbarrows of the stuff in the UK last year. But peat compost comes from, not surprisingly, peat bogs. And these are the homes of lots of really precious wildlife like rare butterflies. They also store tons of CO2, that carbon dioxide we mentioned. The more we keep digging out the peat, the more we keep releasing all that carbon from the ground. This is why at Garden Organic, we have been campaigning against peat compost for years. We want to get it completely banned, in the same way some dangerous chemicals and pesticides have been banned. Our new campaign is called For Peat's Sake, and you can find out more on the Garden Organic website. Compost really can save our soils. Large-scale farming across the world has ruined our soil. We use too many machines and chemicals, and we keep growing the same things in the same place over and over as fast as we can. This means it's no longer as good for growing food. And as we grow 95% of our food in the soil, that's a big problem. Now we've already learned how compost puts life into soil, so it's no surprise that adding some compost to farmers' fields all over the world would completely fix this problem. It would put back some of that organic carbon that has been lost over the years. It would bring it back to life. Now we're getting a bit technical now, but compost is brilliant at making soil store carbon. Now yes, composting does release CO2 or carbon dioxide, now this seems like a bad thing, we're all trying to stop releasing so much carbon at the moment, aren't we? But it's actually only releasing the carbon that was already held in all that fruit, vegetables, grass and plants. It hasn't created new carbon, and interestingly it still holds on to some of that carbon too. Even better than that, scientists have discovered that adding compost to soil actually improves its ability to store even more carbon, by quite an amount. So how many people compost at home? Well at the moment we think it's only about a quarter of households. It's hard to know for sure as we haven't gone round and knocked on every door in Britain, but it's a good guess based on what we've learned over the years at Garden Organic. In more countryside areas there will be more people composting as they tend to have larger gardens and are better connected to nature because they're surrounded by it every day. In large towns and cities, there will be less as people have smaller gardens or no gardens at all. Once again, it's hard to know for sure, because I for one am not volunteering to stick my head into every bin bag in Britain, but we know from studies looking at what people throw away that about a third of every single bin has stuff in it that could have gone into a compost bin instead. Now obviously every house is different, but it's just a rough guess. That's a lot of stuff though. Think how much less weight that is for all those trucks to carry and how much more organic carbon that is going back into the soil. So next up we have some tips on how to compost. The main areas are its position in the garden, how hot it gets, how much air gets to it, what you feed it and how wet it is. Let's go through these now so you'd know how to look after your own compost bin at home. Let's start with food. Just like we need carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals and water, compost also needs to be fed the right balance of things to be healthy. It's a bit easier for compost, as all they need is about a 50-50 mix of greens and browns. Greens are rich in nitrogen and rot down really quickly. Things like grass, vegetable peelings and fruit scraps. Browns are rich in carbon and take longer to break down. Things like cardboard, leaves and sticks. Add too many greens and your compost will be slimy and smelly. Add too many browns and your compost will be too dry. Now although all these things will break down in a compost bin, we shouldn't add them as they will attract rats. This includes meat, fish, cooked food, bread, bones, pasta, liquids like custard and gravy, dairy products, so milk and cheese. At the end of the list there is thick woody material like branches, which are too thick to break down, but these can be composted if they're chopped up. Now these ones are absolute no-nos as they won't compost. 
crisp packets, plastic bags or any kind of plastic, milk or juice cartons, cling film, glass, metal, all of those should be recycled where they can or go into your general waste bin. Now cat and dog poo would compost, but it shouldn't be as it can spread nasty diseases. Next, heat and air. When we dump all that organic matter in your bin, everything heats up as all the little organisms, the decomposers, get to work. Now when you add those browns, like egg boxes and sticks, it creates little pockets of air, and the air makes everything heat up even more, and so all that organic stuff turns into compost quicker. So if we don't add air, it can take 12 to 18 months to make some proper compost, but it can take as quick as 12 weeks, with lots of air added. So the position basically where to put it. Composting will happen wherever you put your bin, but if you put it directly onto the soil, all the decomposers can get in easily. Your compost heap or bin needs sun to work too. If you put it in a shady spot behind your shed and under a tree, it will take a lot, lot longer. You shouldn't have to add water if you look after your compost bin properly, but if it's getting dry, then it will help. The important thing is to get that 50-50 mix of greens and browns, and that should keep it not too wet and not too dry. If you're not sure, a quick squeeze test will help you check. It should just feel damp. Remember to always wash your hands well after being in the garden though, or even wear gardening gloves too. So what are the main things we've learned about compost? Compost is made up purely of rich organic matter like fruit, vegetables and grass. Soil has some of this organic matter, but lots more rock, sand, silt and clay too. Why should we compost? It helps your garden grow. It saves money on manufactured products. It reduces waste and pollution. It stops us from damaging peat bogs by using peat compost. It saves our soils by putting organic carbon back, and it also helps store extra carbon in the soil by absorbing it from the atmosphere. The perfect diet for compost is a 50-50 mix of nitrogen-rich greens, like grass, fruit and veg, and carbon-rich browns, like cardboard, leaves and woody prunings from your garden. Compost is broken down by a complex food chain of decomposers, all feeding off organic matter and each other. So that's it. That's the end of our composting session. I hope you enjoyed it. You now know about decomposition, soil and compost, the decomposers at work, why we should compost and how best to do it. We've got a quiz for you to do before you finish and you'll find that on the page you first came to when you followed the link. Before you leave, there are some links for extra information if you're interested. They're also on the main page too, so don't worry about trying to write them down now. The first one will take you to our website to find out more about composting, the soil, and organic growing and the five principles I mentioned at the start. The second one will take you to a whole page of resources and ideas for activities for schools and people wanting to learn at home too. The third one is all about Garden Organic or Heritage Seed Library membership. And the fourth one is all about the different kinds of projects we provide. Thanks for watching. Make sure you do the quiz before you leave though. We'll collect all your answers and share them with your teachers so they know how carefully you've all been listening. Thanks. Bye for now. <laughs>